Good afternoon, everyone. I call this regularly scheduled meeting of the Ways and Means Committee to order. I'm the chair of the committee, Council Member Abdi Wasami, and we are joined by Council Members, Council Vice President Jenkins, Council Member Palmasano, Council Member Johnson, and Council Member Cunningham. And we are a quorum of, we have a quorum of the committee, and therefore we can conduct city business. First, I want to recognize our city coordinator, uh, Mr. Mark Ruff. Welcome up. Thank you, uh, Chair Orsami, members of the committee. Thank, thank you for a few minutes to welcome a new employee here at the city. Um, very important position. We have with us Fadi Fadil, who is our chief information officer, which for those not familiar is also our department head for our information technology department, a key part of the city enterprise. And if you'd be willing, I'd just ask uh, Fadi to give a little bit of background on himself. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon to Osami, members of the committee. My name is Fadi Fadel. Um, I uh, am honored and happy to serve as your new CIO for the city. I lived in Minneapolis for 14 years, and I'm currently also a resident of Minneapolis. It has given me a home and a community, and uh, I am very excited to give back and serve in the role of technology where we can change and impact People, people's lives. Um, I feel I look forward to working together to uh, achieve a vision for the city of Minneapolis worthy of its stature as a world-class smart city. We have a lot of opportunity with technology to change people's lives. We can open doors, we can kick in the jammed doors, and when there's a wall, we can definitely install a door for you. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Fado, and any Questions or comments from my colleagues? Thank you. Welcome aboard. And first of all, we have a public hearing, and that's the first item on our agenda. And the item says uh, procedures for setting compensation levels for mayor and city council members' ordinance. Uh, passages ordinance amending Title II, Chapter 14 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to the administration in general, amending, establish, st amending establishing procedures for setting or changing compensation level, levels for the mayor and city council members. Uh, a worthy item, and we have our city clerk, Casey Carl, to do, the, to do the introduction. Go ahead, Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and may it please the committee, I'm here to present this ordinance, which, as the chair indicated, proposes a process for future consideration of any changes to the compensation that's paid to the mayor and members of the city council, consistent with the requirements of state law and the city charter. Under Chapter 744 of Minnesota Session Laws 1971, the city council is empowered to set the compensation for both the mayor and the city council by resolution. However, that same law prohibits any modification to the set levels of compensation within an elective term. Thus, the only time that compensation may be changed is during the final year of one elected term, then it becomes effective in the first year of the next succeeding elective term. I've attempted to illustrate this statutory timeline in the graphic that is on the overhead here, and we've passed out copies at your desks. Under the city charter, the mayor and council serve in concurrent four-year terms. Therefore, in order to adjust the compensation levels paid to these elected officials, the council would need to set new rates by adopting a resolution in the fourth year of one term, and then those new rates would then become effective beginning in the first year of the next four-year elective term. This proposal was first introduced by council members Gordon and Johnson last year and was referred to staff for review and the preparation of the draft ordinance before you. I would defer to either of the council members for their comments, but would say that the process, which is reflected in the draft ordinance, raises the issue of compensation for elected officials and brings greater transparency to that matter. In prior years, these matters have been wrapped into the entire budget process, which can reduce awareness of the proposal for any changes. This process would require that the standing committee of the council having primary responsibility for finalizing the city's proposed operating budget would consider and make a formal recommendation to the full council before being incorporated into the budget process. I would also point out that because state law restricts the timing of when changes in the rates of compensation may be considered, this is not an annual process. Rather, it can only be considered, as I have said, in the last year of one term leading into the next year of a four-year elective term. So, for example, 
assuming that this ordinance is enacted, the first time that this process would become effective and be used would be in 2021. That's the final year of the current elective term. So the City Council is now considering establishing a process proactively several years before it would actually become a question to be acted upon. That was, as I understand it, a driving motivation for the sponsors of the ordinance specifically to establish this process well outside of the elective term uh, so that it's outside the pressures of an election. As drafted, the ordinance leaves many of the associated procedures to existing state and local laws and to the rules of the City Council in terms of notice requirements and the actual processing of a proposal to adjust compensation rates in the form of a resolution. That completes my summary of the proposal. Mr. Chair, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Call. Um, any questions from our colleagues? Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Maybe I'm the only person here, but I just need to really understand. Can you explain to me what's the difference? It seems like it will then, the entire difference of this is to come one cycle sooner. Um, the same time this has come in the past. Is that the big change here that we're considering? Mr. Chair, Councilmember Palmasano, I believe that the answer is that the question of any change in compensation to be paid to elected officials would on its own be considered by a committee uh, separate from the actual consideration of the budget. Obviously, as with all of the compensation paid by the city, that needs to be included into the final resolution setting the operating budget for the, for the city. But this would allow that process to be uh, con conducted concurrently but on parallel lines. Mr. Chair, I appreciate what the city clerk says, but um, I think the author might also want to weigh in. I, so then, so then, my new understanding is the only difference that is being made here is that it will come through in a regular council cycle and then come to a committee. Will there be a public hearing? Maybe my colleague can help address um, these. Councilmember Johnson is one of the authors, and we also have Councilmember Gordon, and I'll put you on queue as well. So. Uh, happy to answer the question. Really around the intent was what happened last time, and especially there were uh, seven new council members on the last <clears throat> council term, and the issue of compensation came on as a walk-on item at the last meeting, and I think for a lot of us we didn't realize, hey, this is something where this is our last chance to act, to uh, adjust to a fair level of compensation for the entire next term. And so it, it kind of put us in a bind with it being walk-on that it, at least I can speak to my own feelings, it didn't feel like the level of transparency that we expect around issues uh, and really uh, is what drove this, is that we actually put this in ordinance that this does come up with enough time that it is noticed uh, for the public uh, on the agenda and that it really doesn't catch anybody by surprise again is really the intent uh, behind this. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. And we've been joined by Councilmember Gordon, who's not on this committee, but who's an author of this ordinance as well. So go ahead, Councilmember Gordon. And I think uh, Councilmember Johnson answered it correctly. Right now, the, there's no requirement for it to go to any committee at all. And actually, um, last time that it's, it, there have been, we looked back in the history when we were looking at how this is done and it had gone through ways and means in, in decades past and it also hadn't and there's no requirement that it even goes through a committee and it usually doesn't even appear on the mayor's proposed budget. So even when it goes through the budget cycle, you can hardly, you could notice it very clearly. I will note that we did not include the requirement for a public hearing in this. Um, we, we felt that, um, that we give an opportunity if somebody wanted to take public comment, they could, but it's not an ordinance change, didn't seem like it fit or would be required, didn't necessarily seem like um, something that um, people have the appetite for, but um, we would require it to be posted on an agenda and there'd be notice would be given and it would be considered at the committee before it went ahead to the council. Sort of a minimum basic no, Council, Council, okay. Thank you, Council William Gordon, Council Vice President Jenkins, and then. Thank you, Chair Osami. Um, which committee is being proposed? So this would, this would go through ways and means. The way the ordinance is structured is that it says the City Council Committee responsible for finalizing the city's operating budget. So it come through this committee. 
I suppose it would be the budget committee. Mr. Chair, to clarify that, there are in this term two committees that share oversight of the budget. This committee, obviously, Ways and Means, exercises um, oversight of the budget process generally in a year long. There is also, as you know, a separate committee composed of all 13 council members, the Budget Committee. Uh, each year, each term, when the council organizes and you create committees, you dictate to those committees what their jurisdiction is. So this is a question for the council to decide. Council leadership, uh, I anticipate, would give us some direction in terms of how they want that to be processed through. Uh, even though committees can retain names from one term to the next, just like each council, those, new, those are new committees and they don't always have the same exact jurisdiction. So it would be a question, since this is the first time to formalize this through ordinance, uh, for the council to decide in this term which of the standing committees is the appropriate committee, and then in the future as we create new committees in each term of council to decide which standing committee has that jurisdiction. If I may, Mr. Chair, the other thing I would add to what the sponsor, Mr. Gordon, indicated, although the ordinance does not require a public hearing on the separate resolution, as you are well aware, we do conduct two and now three public hearings on the budget itself. And so the question of compensation would, as part of that budget, be subject to a public hearing. Okay, thank you, and Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and yeah, that's exactly right. It would be germane in that discussion around the public hearing. We didn't want to have a separate one as well because we frankly don't have that for compensation for anyone else in the city. And we really considered a whole range of ideas on this. I mean, we were talking even, do we do independent committees uh, by public citizens to study this, or like how do we get at this number and all this? and in doing that, we talked with colleagues as well, just had informal conversations, and there's a general sentiment that we recognize that we could do better around this, but we also didn't want to overcorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, Over so I think, you know, certainly I would expect that we would have and work with the clerk's office on study of compensation for other similar elected bodies and things like that that could be drawn into the process and engaging with HR around it, which frankly are things that happened uh, in the previous term as well, but I think where there was a miss there was really around the transparency for the public and really for us new council members too, not knowing that that was something that was gonna come up at the last minute ultimately, and, and so we're forced with that kind of tough decision. All right, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate the caution to not overcorrect, um, and I understand that we're, today we're talking about the ordinance, but I am curious, though, around what discussions have been had around procedure, procedurally how this will, um, how we will weave this all together in terms of should we expect for there to be a, a job study? Is it something that we want to have uh, community input on? Have we had those discussions yet um, around what city procedures? This is ordinance, but I'm curious about procedures. Um, and if not, if there's a timeline to be able to really establish that, because I just want to make sure that we have uh, transparency in uh, with, with the process as well. Um, I appreciate uh, setting parameters, but I'm curious just about like the city procedures as well. Stab at that and then uh, see if the authors of the ordinance wanted to add more. I think it was, as Mr. as Councilmember Johnson just alluded, um, a deliberate attempt to set the broadest framework possible within the existing state law, which vests this body as the governing body of the city with the authority to set those compensation levels by resolution. Within that, ordinance, of course, there are council rules um, and other practices where we would codify, I think, more of the actual practices of how that comes forward. Although there have been some discussions about what that looks like, as uh, Ms. Council Member Johnson alluded to, I don't, I'm not privy to any final decision, and we have, as I mentioned on my chart, two years to figure out what those specific provisions would be. Uh, we did, as Commissioner, as Council Member Johnson alluded, do a compensation study through the Human Resources Department in the last term. I would expect that something like that could be an option for the Council to consider going forward as well. So I think those specific questions of, of process are yet to be decided, the ordinance would perf would establish the broadest framework within which the council would agree to operate. Great, thank you. All right, thank you. Any other comments of Council Vice President Jenkins? Thank you, Chair Osami. Um, maybe the authors may be able to answer this question, but would this obligate us then to um, look at 
compensation every four years? Mr. Chair, I'm happy to respond to that as well. Um, no, the the council is not obligated to look at those issues unless the council chooses to give, to give cognizance to the question of compensation rates paid to the mayor and council. Um, in past years, those are issues that have not um, been, or I should say changes have not been made in, in past terms given budgetary realities. The question to always keep in mind is that during a an elective term, the council may not increase or decrease at all. So there is a very limited window of opportunity uh, during which the council can choose to increase or decrease the pay of the mayor and the city council member, and then, as noted, have to live with that for the next four-year term. All right, thank you, Councilmember Cunningham. Uh, I just, I just wanted to say thank you um, to Mr. Mr. Carl as well as my colleagues. Councilmember Johnson and Gordon um, for their leadership on this work. Um, I know that a lot of folks in, out in the community were caught off guard by the decision that was made. And um, so I think that being so proactive in this and really addressing it this early in the term, um, I, I'm really grateful for the public transparency for us to be able to have a fairly challenging conversation um, for the public to be able to better understand what's happening. So thank you all for your leadership. All right. Thank you, Councilman Cunningham. Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I appreciate the words of my colleague, Council Member Cunningham, but I, I'm a little concerned because what I hear is we're not establishing a regular checkpoint here. We're not adding opportunities for the public to weigh in. This feels half done, and it feels like maybe it's a deliberate attempt to circumvent political will. We're not adding a place for there to be a public hearing. Uh, I think I, I get that we don't want to prescribe that it goes to ways and means or budget because that could potentially be combined in the future. Um, I'd be comfortable with it going to either, but we want fair consideration of every single ordinance in this city. Council members Ellison and Jenkins are, and I have had conversations about what that would take. This could be something that would be part of that. Um, but this just kind of feels half done, and I, I do invite the authors to to respond to why they chose not to put any of that kind of meat in this ordinance, but that, that's how I feel about it. Okay. Um, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would actually push back on that piece about there not being a public hearing because, as Mr. Carl stated, there's a public hearing with the budget, and so the way that this would be considered it would actually be out there uh, as and available for people to talk about in consideration with the rest of the budget uh, in terms of actually getting into do we want to try to define the exact process over compensation what is or isn't fair compensation uh, in the ordinance I think is a process piece that can be worked out in the meantime I mean the reality is that Every governing body is different, um, and we've seen this with, for instance, our staff compensation report that was done, that you're never going to find a, a perfect identical match in terms of that, and so there is some level of subjectivity um, through it, and so I would actually invite you uh, to be a part of that process and working on uh, what makes sense and what's fair and how do we get a recommendation through. But uh, typically when it comes to ordinances, I don't think we get to that level of prescription uh, when it comes to uh, a process like that. That's usually something that's more administratively is, is what I've seen with a lot of things worked out. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Council Member Johnson. And I want to note that Council Member Fletcher has joined the meeting. So he was here for a while, but back and forth. So I want to take a note of that. And Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just don't understand how that can happen because it would need to be an amendment to the city's budget because there, we would need to be pulling that money out of an adopted levy already. So it, what I'm hearing is that it would either be done very early in the year, but I thought the understanding of where they were moving this was so that it wouldn't have um, it, it, it wouldn't happen before an election in year four but then it would happen after the election, but in time for public hearings, there isn't an opportunity to make amendments 
until later in the budget process. So I don't understand how you would have a public hearing on such an initiative. Um, maybe I'm missing something. Um, KGC, go ahead. May I? There are no details in place, but I'll take a, a stab, uh, knowing the council calendar, or at least my experience over several years with the budget process. This sets in place a very broad framework, and today is the hearing on the ordinance. This would not be an ordinance in future years. It would be a resolution um, where the public's ability to participate outside of informal channels, contacting a council member, sending a letter, or sending an email, would be through the formal hearings processes that are associated with the budget. Uh, again, doing, due to the fact that the standing committees, even the budget process itself, um, outside of dictates by the charter or the statutes is determined by the council on a year-to-year -year basis. Within that flow uh, of meeting dates and hearings, it would be my expectation that the process we ultimately come forward with would have this matter considered by the appropriate standing committee well and enough in advance that the council had made a decision on whether or not to include an increase in compensation for the next term that would then be administratively routed into the budget process through the budget office. That would be a decision of the council by resolution and it would need to be incorporated into the budget. How the timing of that works between the mayor's proposal of a budget, uh, between the council's consideration, probably would mean that the, the practical realities is that this resolution would come forward well early into the fourth year of the term, since the mayor is required to bring forward the budget fairly early in, in the beginning part of the second term usually, or second quarter, I should say. That's your question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That does answer my question, but to me, it still doesn't seem to achieve what the authors were aiming for, which was to establish more clarity and more of an established process. So that's just my own personal feelings on this proposal, um, and I'm eager to hear what the public might have to say in this public hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman Pomsa. I might just add that the authors and our budget chair should have a meeting and hash things yes, out. They yes. Uh, yes, okay. Yeah. All right. So I think that still stands. They could have a meeting and hash it, hash it out. Council Member Gordon? No? Thank you. Anybody else? Casey? So what, what I will do is I will open the public hearing. Is there anyone here wishing to speak to this topic today? Anyone? 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 Seeing no person wishing to speak, uh, or seeing no additional person wishing to speak, is there any other? Okay, so I have the author. So Council Member Johnson and then Council Vice President Jenkins is, is in queue. Thank you, Mr. Right, Chair. Sir. I'll just go ahead and move the passage of the ordinance. All right, thank you, sir. So I, Council Member Johnson has made a motion and Council, Member, Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you. Motion? Thank you, Chair Wasami. I mean, I guess this is this could be considered a uh, discussion on the motion. Mm -hmm. um, so for clarity from the clerk, because you talked about a very small window. Can can this happen anytime during the term or is it a prescribed time frame it's prescribed uh, under the statute that was set in 1971 right. that says in the fourth year of your term the last year of your term you set the compensation rates for the next term to become effective in january of the next year the first year of the next term so the window is that last year so it could the, be within that last year absolutely the council could start its process in january and feed uh, its decision into the mayor's budget recommendation and ultimately vote at the end of the year on the entire budget it could actually be done after uh, the series of hearings uh, as an amendment to the end. So it, it's up to the council to prescribe now that process. All the ordinance does, uh, if adopted in its current form, is say that the council will bring forward any proposed changes in compensation rates for the mayor and council as a separate item mm -hmm. so that there is an increase in transparency to that process, but ultimately, like everything else related to the budget, that would have to be folded into the budget that's adopted by the council. Okay. Thank you so much. Council Member Cunningham. Okay, Council Member Fletcher. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so you said it was in charter that we do this every four years? Uh, through the chair, Council Member Fletcher, it's actually a state law. There is a state law that was enacted in 1971 delegating to the governing body of the city the authority to set compensation rates for mayor and city council, then called aldermen. Uh, and so that law continues to apply. That law sets the parameter that you cannot set or change, increase or decrease, compensation rates during an elective term. So it has to be done in the last year of the preceding term and becomes effective in January of the next uh, four-year elective term. And so I, I'll admit that I had hoped that I knew, I knew that uh, it had been indexed to uh, the rest of the enterprise's uh, staffing increases. I had hoped that it might just be indexed and we might never have to have this conversation again um, and just say, like, we feel fairly compensated and we'll, like, uh, tie ourselves to that. Is it, are we constrained to only set for the following four-year term uh, in Mr. the fourth year or, or could we index it indefinitely and... Um, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Fletcher, I'm quickly out of my uh, zone, and I would ask the uh, City Coordinator, Chief Financial Officer, to speak to that issue because the issue of the indexing you're speaking to is something he did uh, mention to me as I was uh, away from Mike briefly, and so he should speak to the specific question that you've asked. Still rough. <laughs> Chair Orsami, Councilmember Fletcher, I, I, I don't know the second part of your question. I do know that currently, we do index the council's annual salary increases within that four-year term to the average of the contracts that are approved by the council, the average junior contracts. I don't know whether you could indefinitely index it and, and not have an action, in other words, to just continue that indexing. I think we would have to review that with the clerk, and we certainly will undertake that before your final action. All right. Thank you. Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you. This is, um, I appreciate the robust conversation on it. Um, I will agree with my uh, colleague, Council Member Palmasano, about um, process, a similar question to what I had asked about. I just think that um, I, I appreciate that we're bringing this forward way well ahead of time um, so that we have a, a broad framework, a baseline to build with. Um, and I also am really wanting to make sure that we get procedures in place. I did ask if we had a timeline for that. Um, so whether it's from the author or from uh, Mr. Carl, uh, as to if we have a timeline for when we're going to explore, at least for this next, you know, this term or whatever the case may be, um, what the actual process will be in terms of before it comes as an action before the city council. Casey. Uh, Chair Warsami, to Councilmember Cunningham's point, I cannot speak to the specifics of what those procedures will be, but I will note for you, Councilmember, that there are a series of procedural reforms or proposals that I'm currently shepherding. It's my intent to uh, bring forward those proposals in the, in the next year, and this would certainly align with those reforms related to council process, legislative procedure, rules, um, things of that matter. And so it certainly is within that timeline, and we do have two years uh, before we have to finalize what the specific steps and procedures are. So it's not off my radar. Uh, I would obviously need to make sure that I'm uh, cognizant of, of the author's intent and that we can bring forward a proposal that in its specific steps meets the council's expectations. All right, thank you. And I think Ms. Uh, Councilmember Gordon has a comment to make as well on this question. And I think that's clearly accurate. I, I was going to say that um, it's possible we want some kind of staff direction that could help set frame that at some point. I'd certainly be open to that. I know that we had a lot of discussions about what process this would follow and how we would relate it on a um, study of other compensation and how the executive committee might be involved as they often look at compensation levels and those kinds of decisions and agreements. So I think we have a lot of um, room to flesh that out, which we don't necessarily need a staff direction either, but I, that could be something if we're concerned about, we want to have some information about it and understand the process sooner, that's something I think that folks could entertain. Um, this just sets a, a, a clear minimum standard of at least some accountability and some transparency to make sure that whatever happens goes through a standard committee procedure. 
and have an ordinance. All right, thank you, um, Council Member Palmisano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with my colleagues that now is certainly the right time to hammer this out. Um, an executive committee, I think, is, is a great idea because they do deal with other compensation setting levels. Um, but perhaps as evidenced by no one coming to this public hearing, the public is either indifferent or rather they do care, like I do, but it's been largely unknown to them as to what the meat of this proposal is. Um, so I will work to remain open-minded to such a meeting to hammer that out from a budget process perspective, mm -hmm. but until then I can't support this. Right. Thank you, uh, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm glad we're having so much discussion and engagement mm -hmm. on this at this committee. Council Member Gordon and I uh, wanted to talk with colleagues informally about this, and we really did in figuring this out because I think there was a whole range of options that we could have gone to. I mean. Personally, I like the idea of an independent commission that sets uh, or that comes up with a recommendation. And so we're not the ones at the end of the day making that kind of decision. But I realized that of the colleagues I spoke with, they thought that that was maybe a little bit of a, too much of a overcorrection from where we were before. So this really is how can we prevent this from being a walk on item in the future? How can we get a little more? Uh, time and notice to this and be more thoughtful about process and I know that you know like uh, everything else that comes before that isn't set in stone in ordinance you know there's a process behind it and we'll certainly continue working with the clerk's office on uh, making sure that it's data driven and that there's uh, greater engagement around it and that we're uh, to Councilmember Fletcher's point I think even looking at do we uh, consider just saying, hey, it's tied to inflation, it's tied to these other salary increases going forward? So I think there's more discussion to be had about this, but this ordinance is to make sure that it doesn't surprise anyone in the future, that at least we have that, that it gets out there uh, in advance uh, so that nobody's taken aback by it. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Johnson. Um, any discussion, any further discussion? Okay, Council Member Johnson moved approval of this item. Um, seeing no further discussion, those in favor say aye. 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 Those against? Nay. No. Okay, so that's, the that item has been approved. Um, thank you to Council Member, uh, thank you to both authors, Council Member Gordon, and thank, and thank you to Council Member Johnson, as well as our city clerk for giving us an update and uh, answering all our questions. So thank you very much. So now we move to our consent items, which are 31, and I will read those items. Um, item number two uh, is a legal settlement workers' compensation claim of Anthony Smith. Item number three is a legal settlement, and this is a medical claim of Reggie Wright Howard. Item number four is a workers' compensation uh, interest payments related to the Ausland uh, decision. Um, item number five is a transfer of funds from the city coordinator's office to community planning and economic development, Department for Continuation of Energy Technical Assistance Program. Item number six is a gift acceptance from policy link for staff travel and lodging expenses for the, the chief equity officer uh, policy network. Item number seven is a contract amendment with uh, Guna Electric Inc. for convention center meeting room and ballroom wall scones replacement project. Item number eight is a contract amendment with Green Minneapolis for operations of PV Plaza. Item number nine is a contract amendment with Versa Versicon for warehouse renovation project. Item number 10 is a contract amendment with Adolfson and Peterson Construction for East Side Storage and Maintenance Facility Project. Item number 11, Capital Long Range Improvement Committee Appointments, approving the council appointment of Garrett Peterson for seat 11, Ward 6, to fill an unexpired two-year term beginning January 1st, 2019 and ending December 31st, 2020. And uh, item number 12 is an appointment position in the Civil Rights Department, Director of Labor Standards. Item number 13 is an interim lease with Ames Construction for portion of Upper Harbor Terminal site. 
Item number 14 is the Seward Commons project, financing uh, 2200 to 2018 Snelling Avenue South, and 2215 uh, Snelling Avenue South, 1912 East 22nd Street, and 2115 Snelling Avenue South. Item number 15 is Home Program and Neighborhood Stabilization Program Income, income Appropriation. Item number 16 is a Memorandum of Understanding with the uh, Natural Resource Defense Council for support from the Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge. Item number 17 is a gift acceptance from the U.S. Department of State for st staff travel and lodging expenses for the Professional Fellows on Demand Program. Item number 18 is a grant from the U.S. Department of Justice to respond to the opioid epidemic. Item number 19 is a gift acceptance from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health for staff travel and lodging for the Bloomberg American Summit. Item number 20 is a 2020 fire truck donation to the city of Cuernavaca, Mexico. Item number 21 is a contract amendment with Business Watch International for internet-based porn broker and second-hand store tracking services. Item number 22 is a Minnesota Board of Firefighter Training and Education Training Academy reimbursement. Item number 23 is a repair of street failure at 90th, uh, 97th Street South project approval and assessment. Item number 24 is a Hennepin Avenue reconstruction uh, project approval assessment and areaway abandonment. Item number 25 is a Hennepin Avenue streetscape uh, project approval and assessment. Item number 26 is a contract with Waste Management of Minnesota, Inc. for operation of Municipal Solid Waste Transfer Station. Item number 27 is a contract amendment with Hennepin County for road maintenance. Item number 28 is agreement with Hook and Ladder Apartments Limited Partnership for Public Infrastructure Improvements within the Jefferson Street Northeast Public Right-of-Way. Item number 29 is a 28th Avenue South Bridge over Minnehaha Creek project appropriation increase. Item number 30 is a 20, 2019 sanitary sewer availability charges appropriation increase. Item number 31 is a bid for the Fridley softening plant heating, ventilation, ventilating, and air conditioning renovation project. And the final item, item number 32, is a bid for Ali Snow Plowing Services. And I move approval of those items. And is there any discussion on any of those items? And Council Vice President Jenkins, mm -hmm. go ahead. Thank you, Chair Rosami. Thank you, Chair Rosami. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to pull items number eight, mm -hmm. 14, and 18, just to get some clarifications. So that's 8, 14, and 18, right? Yes. All right. Uh, Council Vice President has pulled those items. And go ahead. What is your question? Clarification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, on item number 8, Green Minneapolis, I'm, I'm just curious, is um, PV Plaza considered a public park, or how, how is that being classified? Okay. Um, on item number eight, we have uh, city coordinator, Mr. Mark Ruff, to answer that question. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, Chair Warsami, Council Vice President Jenkins, um, PV Plaza is considered a plaza. It has been operated by Public Works for a long, long time. Um, it is, uh, as you are well aware, undergone significant renovation recently. As a part of that, the contract to oversee PV Plaza was transferred from Public Works to the Convention Center under the idea that it is, it is um, downtown, uh, so. you know, downtown gathering spot and a hospitality spot, much like the Convention Center. Um, it is managed by a nonprofit called Green Minneapolis, but we, we do not view it. It is, it is a plaza. It is a part of our infrastructure, um, not a park from the definition, at least I understand historically. Okay. No, I mean, I mean, my question was prompted. It seems like historically Green Minneapolis has been maintaining parks. Um, is that accurate or? Um, 
Chair Warsami, Council Vice President Jenkins. Um, I can't speak for Green Minneapolis. Certainly, if you'd like to have a longer conversation about the role of Green Minneapolis, I would ask them to come in. Um, they were the entity itself was very involved in um, helping on the fundraising. As we recall, this was about a $10 million project, $2 million from the state, $4 million from the city, and $4 million fundraised from private entities. And so I know Green Minneapolis was very involved with that. Um, you know, the Green Minneapolis, I understand, also has an emphasis on you know, trees within the street infrastructure. So it's not just about parks, but also about how we not only um, make our infrastructure, uh, you know, make a more pleasant environment, but also a connection to the river, as I understand from discussions on a long-term goal um, that would lead from the Nicollet Mall downward. So it's a, it's a broader expanse than just there, you are right there, uh, connection to the commons and that particular issue, I think uh, certainly would, would um, Beth Shogren and David uh, Wilson are the two people who are primarily involved with Green Minneapolis and I would, would encourage you, Council Vice President, either to meet with them individually or certainly if the chair would like them to come before the committee and give an overview, we could certainly arrange for that as well. Um, I would be happy with an individual meeting okay. at this point. Well, thank you. So then my, my next number questions 14. were around um, item number 14, the the sewer commons project and just because you know i'm not on the the housing policy committee um and this just seems like a very complex um process so hoping to get a little explanation on okay. what all the moving machinations are going on here this uh, i would add to council vice president's points this is a complex process and it was a long process as well about nine years it took on so mm -hmm. i think we have somebody to give us uh, an overview go ahead good afternoon members of the committee i'm emily carr a senior project coordinator coordinator with cped um, and i am the staff person on seward commons project financing um, i'm happy to go through um, a little bit of the project and in fact here if i just pull up a map here Um, this is a project, like um, Chair Warsami mentioned, started back in 2009 when the City Council approved an acquisition and concept plan for the site. Um, and then the Council entered into a redevelopment agreement with Seward Redesign, who is acting as a master, redevelop uh, re master developer in two June of 2009. Um, if you bear with me a moment and I can find my map. Um, it's a four acre site in the Seward neighborhood. And here we go. Um, before you today are several actions um, related to financing. Um, and this doesn't show, actually this is not the right one. Hang on, I apologies. Um, so the Bessemer is the site here. There were, uh, three previous phases of development. Um, phase one was 40 units of affordable supportive housing that was done in partnership with Touchstone Mental Health and um, Project for Pride in Living. Sure. Um, there are also 60 units of affordable senior housing at the Cooperage, which is a development by Common Bond Communities. And then along Minnehaha Avenue and 22nd, Seward Commons has revitalized um, commercial space and public plaza development in a development called the Gateway or Verna building. Um, the redevelopment also has included new streetscape and infrastructure that supports this as a transit supportive environment. Um, so this is part of phase three is here. Um, so this is a 128 unit market rate building. And then the second part of phase three is across the street. Um, right here. And that is 32 units of affordable housing. Um, the market rate project here is a partnership between Seward Redesign and Schaefer Richardson. And um, Wade Commons across the street is a partnership project between um, 
Seward Redesign and NOR companies. That's kind of the broad overview. If you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, it is a large and complicated um, project. Okay, and um, Council Member, Council Vice President Jenkins? Yeah, no, thank you for that review. I was pretty familiar with the developments, but I'm just trying to get an understanding of the, mm -hmm. the pay as you go TIF. Um, and uh, loan forgiveness, like just trying to understand what are the financing mechanisms that are. I guess I would say, so there's the um, financing for the Bessemer, which is the market rate project, and um, primary financing for that $32 million project is a Freddie Mac permanent mortgage, developer equity, and um, TIF. Um, and so the city step, the first staff recommendation is to establish a new TIF redevelopment district. And the city would issue a pay as you go note not to exceed $3.476 million. Um, staff has reviewed all the other sources in this project and concluded that each source has been maximized to the extent possible. And that the amount of TIF recommended is the least, uh, lowest amount necessary for the project to proceed. And we're projecting right now that the note would be paid back in 20 years. The second kind of set of recommendations before you today is related to a requested parkland dedication waiver. Um, and that would be for a connection on private property and public right of way between the Hiawatha LRT trail and 22nd Street. Um, and so that would provide a pedestrian and bicycle connection between that Hiawatha LRT trail and the Seward neighborhood, as well as Matthews Park and Triangle Park. The third set of recommendations is related to the existing financing on the site um, that are associated with the original acquisition back in 2009. Um, these recommendations will support the Wadig development, which is this site here, um, as well as rehabilitation of the building at 2215 Snelling, which is right here, which is currently a one-story industrial building. Um, when the Bessemer closes here, um, some of that, they'll, Seward Redesign will make a partial repayment on their existing debt, and staff recommends that that um, repayment be held um, for the Wadag site. And that's kind of how this redevelopment has progressed over the years. Um, the acquisition money is kind of followed from one development to the next phase. Um, Seward Redesign is planning a significant rehab of 2215, which is that one-story industrial building. Um, and they've signed a lease with an established arts and education-based organization to be the anchor tenant. And so the goal of that rehab is to provide long-term affordable space for arts organizations and creative businesses. And this, um, loan modification will help facilitate that because they're planning to use private um, new market tax credits and their own equity for that rehab. So that will help to facilitate that redevelopment. That's a lot in a nutshell. Um, and I'm happy to answer the questions. There's also a representative from Seward Redesign here today. Yeah. Any further questions, Council Vice President? Um, on that, on number 14. Yeah, no, I think that um, clarifies a lot of it. I mean, it, it is a very mm -hmm. um, complicated, complicated uh, complex process that um, has spanned over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I'm not sure how familiar everybody else is with, with these um, these processes, but uh, I appreciate you explaining. Thank you, and uh, Council uh, Member Fletcher. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Wasami. Uh, as uh, as when this came through before, I'm I'm going to vote no on this, and it's not because I don't think it's a great redevelopment. It's not uh, because I don't appreciate the work that's happening, but I just really do have a problem with using TIF for market rate development. I think that. Uh, we are in a place right now where we have a very generous community uh, that we represent who are willing to uh, contribute money towards affordable housing. And we do that uh, when we use TIF for a project. It raises all of our property taxes a little bit, and, and it's a mechanism for us to uh, pay our share for affordable housing in our community. I think it is a much tougher sell um, to ask our community, to ask everybody, um, who pays property taxes in our city, including people who would not be able to afford to live in these apartments, uh, to contribute to their construction. And so I, I, I just struggle with this uh, conceptually, and, and uh, uh, we'll be voting no on it. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Council Member Fletcher. Uh, Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to echo the comments of my colleague, Council Member Fletcher. Uh, back in April, I voted no on this project. Uh, specifically because I don't think we can set a precedent of using tax subsidies for market rate housing. Um, and it's not that this isn't a good project, um, but it's one that I can't support using TIF money for, uh, like I said, back in April. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, any further discussions on this? I would like to add that, you know, I, I do respect my colleagues' point of view. However, this area of, of Ward 6, in particular Seward, hasn't had any mixed income housing for a long time. And it's, that's why it took nine years and a long struggle to actually come to bring this project to fruition. Um, in term, if you look at the project from uh, an overview, if you took a holistic look at the project, it has had three different phases where you've had uh, you know, senior housing, housing for uh, vulnerable folks, with mental disabilities. I mean, very good housing as well, you know, in an area that was just industrial. Um, the, and, and this particular project is very popular in Seward, which has ha like hasn't had any market rate for 40 years. And this even market rate is considering the area a lot more affordable than what we're used to in downtown, <coughs> in, in much more affluent areas of the city. Um, so this is, you know, people are very excited about this project. It brings in new uh, resources to the community. It adds, it adds to the vision that we've had for a long time, which is much more mixed income housing in, 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 in Ward 6 that has been, you know, saturated with a lot of affordable housing. Um, so because there are folks that want to live in, 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 in the ward that can because we don't have housing stock that is mixed. So, you know, I'm very supportive of this project, and I would like to have my colleagues to support it as well. Um, any further discussion on item number? Do you have item, should we just vote on item number 14 or do we go on to item 18? Let's go to item 18 first, yeah, then we're going to revisit. Yeah. It's your discussion, Mr. Okay. Chair, but item number 18. Okay, yes. So Council Vice President Jenkins on 18 and then we have Yeah, else. so item number 18 is the grant from the Department of Justice uh, to respond to the opioid epidemic and I'm just, Curious if um, we have anybody from the health department or that is able to speak to what are the the plans for these grant funds? I see folks from the health department, and before they as they step up, Council Member Cunningham, do you have something to add? Yeah, I was just going to speak to it because I wasn't sure if we had folks here, so okay. um, I'm happy to speak to it afterwards. The chair of peace was going to speak to it, but we have staff, so go ahead. Go ahead, introduce yourself and try to give us an update on the question. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Suzanne Young, a project coordinator for the opioid work. Okay, go ahead. Yes, so. Did, uh, you what want was the question? Me? The question, yes. I'm sorry, the question is, are there plans for these funds? And if so, what are they? Sure. This uh, initiative is a three-year grant. Um, I believe it's 823,000? 32. 32, okay. So over a three-year period, um, within the first 120 days, we have to submit a evaluation plan to the Department of Justice, uh, which we have already started um, making plans for. We met with 
Hennepin County Medical Center this morning to discuss some possibilities of interventions for um, this program. The, this program is for at-risk or survivors of non-fatal overdoses. And the, the intervention would be similar to the Next Step program uh, where we would have wellness, um, trained wellness advocates uh, respond within one hour of an incident, whether it be in the community. The first phase would be working within the hospital. Second phase would be um, community response, working with our first responders. Um, so they would respond within one hour and do harm reduction, um, work with the families, um, work with the person individually if, if they want to participate in, to, in the pilot program. So these are, excuse me, these are intervention funds then, not necessarily prevention. Well, it would be a combination of both. So it would be intervention and prevention. So we would be doing education on prevention and intervention work. But only once someone has overdose. Is At risk or, or has experienced okay. an overdose, yes. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, Council Member Cunningham. You have, no, no, all right, any other further questions? No. Okay, so what I have here is item number, we have three items for 8, 14, and 18. Item number 8, we have an answer to. And item number 18, we have an answer to. And item number 14, we still pulled it and we're going to vote on it. And then we go back to the rest of the items. Right? Okay, so now let's vote on item number 14. All those in, a, uh, in favor say aye. 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 Those against? No. Aye. So there was four in support and two against. That item passes. And then now we go back to the full of the 30, 30 items, and I move approval of those items. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those against? And all those items have been approved. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And having concluded our business on our agenda today, we are adjourned. Thank you.